Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome to the golden age of the silver screen on the MHM Podcast Network, where each episode we review a film from the 1930s, 40s, or 50s. I'm Patrick. And I'm Lori. And for this episode, we're reviewing Pillow Talk with Rock Hudson, Doris Day, and Tony Randall. And Lori, do you have a brief summary of this sexual romantic comedy from the very, very uptight 1959? I do. I don't know if it's short enough. It, it <laughs> might be a little longer than I intended, but I'll give it a shot. You can cut out what you want. Um, Doris Day plays Jan Morrow, a mid-20th century self-reliant interior decorator. Jan is happy and content with her life. The biggest inconvenience that she faces is the Lothario neighbor that hogs their party telephone line. Jan is disgusted by his escapades as she hears him woo many women with the same song, but their first name inserted in the verses. Rock Hudson is Brad Allen, a charming Broadway composer and womanizer, and the man on the party line. Jan complains to the phone company about Brad to no avail. Brad charms the telephone company representative that comes to deal with the situation. A frustrated Jan works out a deal with Brad to use the phone during alternate half hours. Jan is being pursued herself by her friend and wealthy client, Jonathan Forbes played by Tony Randall. Jonathan also happens to be a close friend of Brad. Jonathan confides to Brad that he is head over heels in love with a wonderful woman that he has proposed to. Jan is not interested in a romantic relationship with Jonathan. Having never met Jan in person, Brad runs into her one night at a nightclub. He recognizes her voice and is, and is interested in her. He also is aware that she is Jonathan's love interest. Knowing that she will know his voice as well, Brad fakes a Texas accent to get to know her. Jan is fooled by Brad's act, and she falls for him. Brad uses the ruse to make Jan trust Rex even more. On the phone, Brad tells Jan that Rex only wants to seduce her and will invite her up to his hotel room. On a date, Rex does invite Jan up to his room, but he claims to only want to show Jan the beautiful view. Brad also questions Rex's sexuality since he has not made a move on Jan, which makes Jan eager to kiss Rex. Jonathan is jealous of Jan's new beau and hires a private detective to find out who he is. Jonathan is furious to learn that Brad has his hooks in Jan. Jonathan forces Brad slash Rex to go to his cabin in Connecticut to get away from Jan and to finish the songs that he owes Jonathan. Brad gets the better of Jonathan again by inviting Jan to go to Connecticut with him. Rex and Jan are having a cozy time at the cabin. They are both deliriously happy. Rex steps outside to get more firewood while Jan pecks at the piano while reading Jonathan's sheet music. She is quick to realize that the song she is playing is a familiar one. It is a song that Brad plays on the phone to various women. Jonathan shows up to expose Brad slash Rex and an irate Jan begs him to take her home. Jan is brokenhearted. Brad tries to make up with Jan, but she refuses to forgive him. Jonathan is delighted to see that Brad is also now among the, the brokenhearted. A desperate Brad reaches out to Jan's maid, Alma. It just so happens that Alma is a huge fan of Brad's, having listened in on the party line. Alma loved to hear Jonathan's conversations. Alma suggests that Brad hire Jan to redecorate his apartment. She knows that Jan will not say no if it means that her company would lose a commission. The vengeful Jan designs a gaudy, over-the-top bachelor pad that is so horrible it is funny. Brad is angry when he sees his finished apartment. He literally carries Jan in her pajamas through the streets of New York City to his home. 
He tells Jan that he wants to make the changes to his apartment because he wants to marry her. Jan smiles and turns on one of the bachelor traps to keep Brad from leaving. Brad's love song plays as they make up. In the final scene, Brad is going to tell Jonathan that they are having a baby when Brad is intercepted by an OBGYN that thinks Brad is pregnant. And that is Pillow Talk. All right. Pillow Talk was released on October 6th of 1959, the same week as 40 Man, uh, Career, and Northwest Frontier. The same month as Girls Town, the Crimson, the Crimson Kimono, The Wasp Woman, Solomon and Sheba, The Last Angry Man, and the film, which recounts Lori's formative years in grade school, A Bucket of Blood. The only one I've heard of is Solomon and Sheba. I know it was not a not a very popular month. It was made on a budget of one point six million dollars. It grossed in nineteen fifty nine. It grossed uh, just over seven point six million dollars. It was the fifth highest grossing picture of that year, behind The Shaggy Dog, Operation Petticoat, and Some Like It Hot, and right in front of such films as Imitation of Life, Suddenly Last Summer, and Rio Bravo was nominated for five Academy Awards. I was shocked at this. Five Academy Awards. That is surprising. Lost Best Actress, Doris Day, uh, to Simone Signoret for Room at the Top. Lost Best Supporting Actress, Thelma Ritter, lost to uh, Shelley Winters for uh, The Diary of Anne Frank. Lost Best Art Direction, Set Decoration for a Color Film to Ben-Hur. Lost Best Music, scoring of a dramatic or comedy picture to Ben-Hur. And one, Best Writing, Story and Screenplay Written Directly for the Screen. That was the one at one. Uh, Who was the writer? I didn't write it down. Sorry. (laughs) I'm just curious. Uh, Not a name that caught my attention. There were multiple writers on it, actually. There was more. I think there was four writers total. Uh, was the first of three films that Rock Hudson, Doris Day, and Tony, Tony Randall did together and the, from 1959, I think, to 1964. Uh, was on a, For AFI, it was one of the 400 films nominated for the 100 Years 100 Movies list in 1998. Didn't ultimately make the top 100. Uh, was one of the films nominated for the 100 Years 100 Laughs year uh, list. Also, also did not make the top 100 on that list. However, in 2002, uh, made the top 100 in the 100 Years, 100 Passions list at number 99. In 1960, uh, a sequel was discussed actively, uh, referenced as Baby Talk, which is obviously where the film ends up at. However, it never panned out and never came to fruition. In 1980, the sequel talk renewed uh, again, where there was a possibility of Rock Hudson, Rock Hudson and Doris Day uh, reuniting for a sequel ultimately did not uh, pan out as well, mainly because Doris Day retired from acting permanently, uh, was inducted into the National Film Registry in 2009, and Rotten Tomatoes has it at 94% critics and 87% audience. And that is the numbers on Pillow Talk. So, all right, Lori, I believe this is a film you chose that you wanted to review. Oh, I did? Yes, you did. I, I- <laughs> I know I've seen it and I, I liked it. I mean, it's a it's a fun movie. And I love the chemistry between Doris Day and Rock Hudson and Tony Randall. All right. I, you know, I thought I had seen this film and I didn't realize that the trio of them had done three films together. I've seen one of the other three. I, I watched this. I was going, this is not what I remember the film being. So I don't know which one of the other two that I saw, but this was not it. This was the first time I've ever seen this film. And I have to say I was underwhelmed by it I, I agree with you they have chemistry together but it was it, it was a, an unusual film for 1959 it was trying to mm-hmm. be risque but it's so so dated that it doesn't quite get there in 1959 I could see where it was there but by 2024 standards pretty tame <laughs> and a lot of the jokes are just so dated oh yeah and so. yeah I mean, the uh, the gay jokes by Rock Hudson mm-hmm. caught me a little bit off guard. I was like, oh, that's ironic now knowing about his, you know, uh, revelation uh, two decades later. Uh, but oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it was. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that was that, that's weird for the time. But um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, like 
well, let, let's break it down. Let's let's start by talking about the the, the actors of the film. Let's start with Doris Day. Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, when I think of Doris Day, I honestly do think of you, Lori, for some reason. And I've never seen a lot of films by her. I just I think of kind of squeaky clean, a goody two shoes, and uh, likes to sing, and that all applies to you. <laughs> she has an amazing voice. She, she does. Uh, th- this is a little bit out of her normal wheelhouse, I would say. That she, this was, she, she this was risque for what what her public persona was in 1959. Agree. Yeah. All right. What did you think of her performance in it? I I liked her. Um, I I um you know I until I watched it this time, I never thought about what an independent woman she was, and and how exciting that was for, I mean, I wasn't alive in 1959, but the stereotype of 1959 wasn't her. It was a housewife. And so I I would have loved to have seen a sequel to this to see if, um, I think it would have been fun if she had stayed an independent woman, you know, because I don't think that Brad was a conventional um, male, you know, so, but I also this time was bothered by, I'm sorry, I'm going off on the plot, and we're supposed to be just talking about Doris Day. <laughs> I like, I loved her. All right, I, I appreciated that. You know, not knowing what this film was about, and knowing what my the stereotypical role for Doris Day was, this w- did not fit into that, and so it was a little bit interesting to see that. I agree with you that she is a very forward-looking woman, a, a, almost a woman of modern day, a professional woman who has success and is respected by other people around her, although pursued, pursued by uh, all the, the male characters uh, throughout the entirety of the film, you know, essentially trying to woo her, if you will. But she, she's a, an independent success, not relying on any other man for the success that she's had in her life to that point in time. So that, I thought that was unique and unusual for a 1959 film. That was one of the few things about it that was more modern day uh, and very progressive for its time. Uh, so I, I liked her in her performance. What about Rock Hudson, though, playing kind of the Lothario in this film? You know, I think... Rock Hudson is one of the only people that could have gotten away with it because he is just so likable. And um, I have just have always had a sweet spot for Rock Hudson. I remember as a kid, we toured Universal Studios and they said if whenever Rock, I never saw him, but that whenever he was on the lot, he would stop and talk to the people on the tour. Oh, really? And, um, yeah, they. I just heard that he was just the nicest man, and you know, I really grieved with um, when he died in the eighties, and and I just, just I don't know. I've just always had a sweet spot for Rock Hudson, and I and I really, I like him in this role. But as I said, I think the 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 jokes are are very dated and just don't sit well in today, and. Um, but I did buy their chemistry, but I didn't buy how quickly she forgave him and stuff. I mean, there's just a lot, it, it, but it, I don't think it was meant to be taken seriously. It's meant, it's a light film. It's just meant to be fun. But I, I think that other actors in the role could not have pulled it off. I don't think they would have still been likable like Rock Hudson was. Yeah. You know, the, the little role he plays is, is kind of the little playboy, um, it seems very stereotypical. I've seen it done in many other films, seen it done in other, many other films in the late 1950s, early 1960s by other actors. And I'd honestly say I've seen it done better. I, I didn't find anything special about his performance in this. And I, and I, and I do like rock Hudson in some of the other films that I've seen, but I usually see him in more Westerns or dramas or action films. I, 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 I I can't say I've seen him in a lot of comedies other than that other Doris Day film, which I don't know which one I saw. Uh, I believe he played a scientist in it, and that's all I remember about it. It's it was like Lover, Come Back, and I can't remember the other one. Uh, you, do you remember which one where yeah. he's a scientist? I don't. <laughs> I don't. Get, this was my favorite. Oh, okay. Pillow Talk was my favorite. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I didn't think there was anything really special about his performance. I, I have some comments, uh, much like you, as far as the 
believability of the romance between the two of them. As far as actors, I think Doris Day and Rock Hudson have chemistry. As far as characters, I don't think the characters have chemistry. But we're going to get to that in a few moments. But what about Tony Randall? You know, the the third wheel, if you will, to this romantic comedy. What did you think of his performance? It, it was it was goofy. It was goofball. But I I thought he he did a good job. I mean, he was. It's funny, and I don't know if it's just because I like Rock Hudson so much, but I thought he was slimier than Brad. Yeah, in the film. It, yeah. Yes, he was. <laughs> Which, once again, was also off-putting. That's not what I usually expect Tony Randall right? to do. I mean, yeah. granted, I have him uh, stereotyped in my mind as one of the odd couple. <laughs> and he is not that character in this film by any stretch of the imagination. And he seems like the sleazier of the playboys that he's trying to get into Doris Day's pants any way he can and he's using the business transaction to potentially get there so yeah he does seem sleazier they don't quite go all the way there Uh, they don't go quite all the way there in the film they pull it back a little bit but i i i do think that he is uh the the worst of the two yeah it's 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 interesting just uh, um but he adds he definitely adds a lot to the his character adds a lot to the plot and and i think that that he acted well with with what he was given now getting on to something that you've kind of hinted at and i've already hinted at the believability of these two characters actually mm-hmm. ending up together the character I, I agree with you i think the actors have chemistry i had a problem with the story and the fact that this the entire relationship is built off deceit <laughs> and yeah the quickness that she forgives him at the end of the film for the two couples ending up or the two couples, the, the couple to end up together is the definition of Hollywood ending and seems so mm-hmm. utterly abrupt. It was like, what? The, the, everything is just all hunky dory and we're all good. And, and everything that had been built up about that. I loved about her character, her independence. As soon as he said the word marriage, Correct. she just, fell in his arms literally uh, utterly destroyed so it was like yeah. you suddenly became that stereotypical stereotypical character that all you want to do you you've established a career just so you can hook a husband and then you can be done you know that's almost what it's implied that she just jumps into that relationship so quickly yeah i agree with you it just did not sit well with it me watching the end of this film yeah i i definitely enjoyed it more when i was younger and i didn't really <laughs> think about it <laughs> It's well, one that I think I caught on Turner Classic Movies or something when I was a kid. Well, when she finds out that he's been playing her the whole time, deceiving her to, to be someone else, and almost pushing her into the direction as himself and as the fake character to establish this relationship, I would have believed this character, who they've established, would be much, much angrier <laughs> than right. she played in the film. Now, she was angry, but... To the point where, you know, that they she would never, ever have considered being in any kind of relationship with him based off yeah. the, the deceit that he's already created in their relationship. And I like to think that part of the reason she was so upset was because he fooled her. And she was, I think, you know, she was someone that had good sense and was cautious and she fell for him. But then the ending just blows all that. And I'll agree with you on that as well, but turning it to his side of thing, he was such the Lothario, the playboy, you know, uh, going out and having uh, multiple women, multiple lovers, if you will. And he seemed to be like, I'm going to, you know, try to prove something to this woman. I never saw what suddenly switched where it was like, okay, now he's in love with her. She is the one for him. It never, it never sat with me uh, very well watching the film that why does he suddenly care? You know, why is this? And how do, how do we know he was, he was pursuing all these women Correct. with the same song? He did not sing the song to her though. No, he didn't. But you know, the, it never, you know, why, why the sudden attractive, you know, so why I, I can get the I'm attracted to her. What I don't get is I'm in love with her and I want to marry her. 
<laughs> yeah. why, why did he switch as well? I mean, both of them, once they know, he knew who she was right away. He despised her for all intents and purposes. And the film plays off as like, uh, he's going to get one on, on her by basically seducing her and showing that he has that kind of power over her. And then suddenly he's in love with her. Why? <laughs> like, I, I don't get that. What about her? just was so compelling to you and, and and the film doesn't really address that for me no and and i would say he kind of fell for her at first sight which considering how aggravating they were to each other was was a little hard to believe as well that he, yeah I, I did i agree with you i didn't see where he, he actually fell yeah i, I don't I, I never believed that these two people fall in love with each other although that's where the film is supposed to take us i think i believe that just because of their chemistry oh. and the other films well, <laughs> maybe the other films but not not in and film. i think the other one was send me no flowers that sounds about right but i don't remember but which one he's a scientist <laughs> i don't either i don't either i know i've seen that one like two or three times it used to come on a lot when i was a kid it's been about 30 years since 34 oh god since i was a kid 30 years ago i would have been 21 so probably about 40 years ago that i saw it so it's it's sometime in my past since i've seen it but i do remember rock hudson and i do remember uh doris day in it and tony randall that was the the actor i knew the best at that time all right a little bit of music in this film Lori, what did you think of the music? It was, it was the song was was appropriately hokey. <laughs> um, his uh, theme song, love theme song, if you will. Um, that scene in the the bar, uh, what was that song that they did? That that was a little weird. <laughs> the, I can't remember the name of that song. And she started singing with the band. Yeah. That was that was a good song, but that was that was a little weird. But and then the the theme song. I'm trying to remember the theme song. Pillow talk. Was that what it was called? I think it was called pillow talk. I think it was your typical kind of late fifties, early sixties, where they had a a theme song written for the movie, and one of the stars sang it, and you know, like the Parent Trap and. All those songs had, all those movies had the theme song. Um, I think it was, it was like that. Yeah. Uh, music was driving me up the wall. <laughs> it was slowing down. The the stat, oh, yeah. The, you, it definitely was dated to that time. It, 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 it definitively was dated to that time. <laughs> yeah. I, I, once again, you, you know, my opinion on music is that if it mm -hmm. enhances the story, I think it's a good thing. If it's just, we're going to have a musical interlude like his song and the fact that he sung it to so many different women by ch and just slightly changing the lyrics. Now that was a story element. I got that, that little vignette in that bar, the weird song. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay. Roly poly. Was it really yeah. poly? Something like why, that. Yeah. Why are we doing this other than we're giving her a chance to sing? <laughs> well, she is Doris Day. Well, so. I, I understand, but uh, <laughs> I am myself and I would, I, I, don't like when we just let's take a moment to have a musical interlude but and that the comedies of that era had that same kind of kind of no, that's not exactly what it was but you know what i'm talking about yeah when instead of a laugh track they used the music to tell you when to laugh correct i don't know which is more annoying because the laugh track was really annoying too <laughs> All right. Now, this was a romantic com a sexual romantic comedy in 1959, and this was kind of a, a genre during that time. As I said, it seems exceptionally dated, possibly progressive for its day, risque even for its day, the way they shot things in split screen, showing the two of them both in like bathtubs or both laying on the bed at the same time uh, and it, giving the illusion that they're in bed together or in a bath together, which they are not. They're in separate rooms. But, uh, you know, what did you think of the fact that they were essentially trying to push the boundaries of, of what was acceptable in 1959? I think 
uh, Hollywood's always trying to push the boundaries. Oh, I disagree with you on that. I think sometimes you do? some people in Hollywood are trying to push the boundaries. I think most of the time Hollywood likes to live within the boundaries. Boundaries uh, ha- ha- are predictable. Uh, boundaries give some so- some sort of protection. Every once in a while, someone wants to push something out, but most of the time, I think they want to live within those boundaries. I think everybody wants to be the one that breaks them and succeeds, but it's Correct. scary and not many have the courage to do it. Yeah. I want, I believe everybody wants success. And if they think pushing the boundaries will give them success, they'll do that. And this was a very successful film. I mean, this was fifth highest grossing film of the year nominated for five Academy Awards. I was blown away by that five Academy Awards. This does not strike me as a single Academy Award nominated comedies film. don't often fare well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 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 then it won for screenplay uh, of of the five it was nominated for. I could understand Doris Day to a certain extent. I could actually understand Thelma Ritter. I thought she did it a very very good performance in the limited time she had on screen. But the story, the screenplay, I thought was the weakest of the five that awards it was nominated for, and that's the one that it won. <laughs> All right. Anything else on this film, Lori? No, I don't think so. I just. I would have liked to have seen a sequel, especially in the early 80s. I don't know. I think that would have been cool to see them reunited and and um, to see where they, as long as it was done well. Uh, you know, I thought the, I, I didn't read much about the 1960 proposed sequel. There was just discussions of it. I read something about the 1980 proposed sequel where their child would be getting a relation, beginning a relationship with another man and the two of them are divorced, but the prospect of reuniting between uh, getting back together is there. So kind of like parallel stories. Uh, I thought that was a little bit more interesting, it's interesting to see, uh, come back and revisit it 20 years later. That would have been a very progressive, once again, very progressive for a, a 1980 film, but ultimately didn't pan out. All right. Well, let's wrap it up, Lori. Uh, ultimately, uh, what do you think of the film? Uh, how do you rate it on uh, one to five stars? And did, does it live up to your memory? Does it live up to your expectations from when you saw it when you were younger? I, I have to admit I was a little disappointed. I remembered it more fondly than seeing it today. But um, I still liked it. I think it's an enjoyable film. I think it's worth watching just to see the chemistry between Rock Hudson and Doris Day. And I would give it three pillows. Three pillows. All right. Well, uh, I would give it two rings on the phone, the party line. (laughs) (laughs) It it had some good production values. I did. I thought the cinematography, the camera angles and the split screen made it a little more, a little interesting to watch. It, it was predictable, not believable. Uh, So I have many problems with the story elements of it, but they're delightful actors. I like Tony Randall. I like Rock Hudson. I don't dislike Doris Day. Uh, and I actually like the fact that she was not the Doris Day that I was expecting her to be in this film based off my you know, memory of other Doris Day roles. But um, yeah, I, 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 I think the acting was the strength. Uh, cinematography was the second strength. But then the story really drag it down. So ultimately, I would only give it two stars. I, I was disappointed in the film because whatever the other film is and i think it send me no flowers that i saw years and years ago i liked that film uh so i remember that more fondly than i'm going to remember this film sounds like i might like that one more today than i did (laughs) as a kid (laughs) maybe all right well that's it for our review of pillow talk please let us know what you think of the film in the comment section and for our listeners over on moviehousememories.com please rate the film from one to five stars on that page as well. If you've enjoyed today's review, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, the MHM podcast network, where we have many, many more film reviews from yesterday, today and beyond. Well, until next time on the big show, when we review another classic film from the 1930s, forties or fifties, I'm Patrick. And I'm Lori. Good night. And that's a wrap.
podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The song Hyperfun is brought to you by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the golden age of the silver screen, the MHN Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.